Hi, Reality Riffing. I have been talking about this interview for now months. I sat down with the epic, the legend, Susan Weed. She is one of the most important herbalists and feminists of our time of the 20th and 21st century. And I was really surprised by some of her teachings and her wisdom. She laid it down. She's a straight shooter. She's my kind of woman. And I really enjoyed having the great honor of uh, talking to her about all things herbs and all things what, what's happening on the planet right now and your health and how to use herbal technologies as well as uh, the way that health and vitality moves through chronology. She has many, many best-selling books and uh, I am just over the moon to bring you Susan Weed. One of the most important words of Rama Institute for Applied Yogic Science and Technology is applied. We know that this works and one of the most beautiful things about Rama Business School over these past years is thousands and thousands and thousands of businesses all over the world have been launched and I meet people who say I created my business from watching Rama TV and doing Rama Business School. Hello, Immense Grace, High Reality Riffing here with so much just uh, honor to sit with the great Susan Weed. Um, uh, Susan, I love that you write. You you have no official diplomas of any kind, just so so punk rock of you, um, but in, a, an immense amount of experience and have authored six best-selling books that really have changed the face of uh, health and holistic health and healing and understanding of herbalism um, in the West and then now translated into all these languages. So um, thank you so much for your great contribution and thank you for being here. I'm very honored to be here. I hope to share green blessings with you and everyone. Thank you. So I would love to just kind of jump into where, I mean, you've had this massive career, you have a, a lineage and a legacy of, of great uh, wisdom that you've created and, and is kind of has its tendrils all around the world. And I would love to just talk about where you are now as an herbalist, as a, a priestess, and what's kind of exciting you right now. One of my past apprentices is a midwife. As a matter of fact, there are more than one past apprentice who's a midwife, but this particular one I've been very closely in touch with. And she proposed that she and I write Wise Woman Herbal for the Childbearing Year continued. My book, Wise Woman Herbal for the Childbearing Year, my first book has been continuously in print for over 35 years. And it's a wonderful, wonderful book. I, I sometimes wish that I could achieve such simplicity again. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, because as you accumulate knowledge, it tends to accumulate you as well. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and uh, certainly 35 years ago, you know, um, we didn't have what Astrid and I are calling the nightmare pregnancies. You're pregnant and suddenly you're diagnosed with cancer. Right. You're pregnant and you're told you have HIV. You're pregnant and you're addicted to opioids. Right. Right. There, these things were really not even on the radar 35 years ago. So we have a section on the nightmare pregnancies and what you can do, how you can support yourself. And even the non-nightmare pregnancy has changed so much. The first thing that I tell women, if they're going to enter the system with their pregnancy, is the very first thing you have to do is lie. Because they're going to ask you when your last period was. And the norm now is the belief that it's healthier to induce labor at 38 or 39 weeks than let the pregnancy go to term. Right. So I say, buy yourself three extra weeks right at the beginning so that you don't get induced too soon so that your baby gets a chance to decide when it's going to be born without intervention. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, you know, I'm going to a nice birthing center and you go in. And they say, oh, it's standard uh, procedure here for us to put a line in you. We just want to put an IV in you. That way we'll keep you hydrated. 
what they don't tell you is they can also give you drugs through that. Right. And they will. Right. And they will. And not necessarily tell you that they're going to do that. So my so minimal for the childbearing year continued. It's not a rehash of what I've already written. It's entirely new material on what's going on now. Everything I wrote stands. The plants don't change their minds. Right. Right. So that's all, you know, absolutely good and just as good as it was the day it was written. But we have more to say. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I was talking about this this morning, just it, it, it's 2021 and um, you've been on the front lines of, of women's health and, and just the battlefield of women's health, even in the Western world and what that looks like. And, and um, I think in 2021, we there may be different battles raging, but I mean, you can't say that it's not still a battle, battlefield. It's... In many ways, it's worse. Yeah. Because women's rights are being legally taken away under the idea that giving people who believe they are women rights is equitable and just. And I certainly believe that everyone deserves rights but i don't think we want to do it by taking away other people's rights yeah 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 so i'm uh, i was part of a group uh, that put out a book called the four mothers of women's spirituality and it was published by a big publisher when it came out they emailed all of us at once and we've used that as a way to stay in touch and this has been a, a something of particular importance to us the erosion of women's rights and the erosion of the idea that women go through menopause and women get pregnant not just anybody who wants to say they are but actual women people who have xx in their chromosomes mm -hmm. you can present yourself to me any way you want to i'll call you any pronoun you want to you want to be a giraffe with purple polka dots and i call you zisk that's absolutely fine. <laughs> i'm all for it i yeah. love you to pieces yeah. right yeah but but unless you have xx in every cell you're not a woman yeah this is not a woman that's it yeah. So um, I now take part um, every Saturday morning in um, a forum, a feminist rights forum, a forum that is worldwide to protect women's rights against these laws that are eroding women's rights all over. And what would you say, uh, you know, for uh, I think there's a lot of women, especially women in, in kind of more privileged um, places in, in the world that are not paying attention to this. And what would you say is an important place to start to do some research or um, get some get some education on? Can you give us a little guidance? Um, the. I can give you, but not right now, the website address of this forum that occurs every Saturday morning. Okay. It's moderated through England. It's a worldwide forum. Everyone is invited to attend. Great. Great. I don't have the address by heart, yeah, but course. I'll make sure that you get it and anybody who wants. And we're so excited to see, especially worldwide, how many young women, women in their 20s, women in their 30s, are really seeing that they have to stand up and declare that they're for women's rights. Yeah. Otherwise, their rights are going to be legally taken away from them. Kind of, kind of, so in the battlefield that you're talking about, right, as John Murr said, you know, when you're, when you're working ecologically, it's not like, oh, you win and that's it. You like right. sit back and relax. No, right. you, you have to keep showing up all the time there. So thank you also for all that you're doing and promoting it. And every woman, um, is going to be reached and touched in a different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what do you? What are the big themes right now that you're seeing in terms of the erosion of, of uh, rights? I mean, there's a huge erosion of medical freedom rights uh, that we're seeing. That's quite, I mean, disturbing in my opinion. Um, what other? You know, what are you seeing in terms of what's kind of on you guys' minds and hearts? The um, well, you know. Starting about 25 years ago, the word guy started being used a lot. You would walk into a group and people would say, hey, you guys. Yeah. And I started saying to people, I'm not a guy, I'm a gal. And they said, oh, I mean everybody. And I'm like, well, guy doesn't mean everybody. It means guys. Um, so if really, if it means everybody, why don't you say, hey, you gals? 
because that could mean everybody too. As a matter of fact, at this point, I use only um, language that includes everyone. So I say goddess because that includes God. Hmm. But God doesn't include goddess. And I say her because that includes he, but he doesn't include her. And similarly, she includes he, but he doesn't include she. And woman includes man, but man doesn't include woman. So I use she and her and goddess and woman as the inclusive language that includes every single human being on this planet. Wow. I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, people have a hard time. That they say, no, wait, wait, wait. I'm like, yeah, uh -huh, you tell me where I'm wrong on this. You know? like, yeah. uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I'm, 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 I hear it. Um. <laughs> I was at a, a big international herb symposium, and uh, I was going to go to a talk given by Native women on berries and fruits of the area. I thought, oh, you know what, a delightful talk. And I went in, and it didn't. First of all, it didn't look like a Native woman, but you know, you never can tell. And there were very few people in the room, and that seemed odd. And they didn't have anything about berries or fruits up on the screen. I, was I late? Of course I'm late. I'm always late, especially at conferences. I know you too, right? We always have a good excuse, though, because it was that person who stopped us. We had to answer the idiot. I'm always late. You're always late. We know about being late. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of, you know, come into the back of the room. But it's hard because there's only five or six people in the room. And they all, like, turn around and look at me and say, what are you here for? I'm, like, I'm here to learn about, you know, fruits and berries of the region. They say, that's not happening. I say, oh, what is happening? They say, we're talking about herbs for trans people. Mm. And I sit down and I say, oh, that is Great. I'm just as happy to learn about that as I am to learn about fruits and berries. As a matter of fact, I've been involved for 30 years because 30 years ago, an MD in Manhattan approached me after a talk at the Open Center and said, will you please come and talk to me about herbs that can be used to help people who are transitioning? Hmm. So I said, you know, I've been, you know, part of the community for 30 years and, you know, actively working with them. They said, are you a trans? I said, oh, goodness, no. And they said, get out of the room. And I said, is this what acceptance feels like? Right. Yeah. We have a lot of this this happening, this agenda of divisiveness in this is, yeah. I yeah, I'm you know, hey, I'm uh, you know, I'm a long term supporter and tell me what you're doing. I'm interested to know. No. No, we're not gonna share with you. Yeah. But, you know, it left me feeling very very odd. It was the weekend that Alabama had um made termination of pregnancy at any point illegal, yeah. um, I, I, you know, with big punishments. And the little name tag that we had had preferred pronoun on it. And so I did like an underground resistance. And I said, in the face of the fact that women's rights have just been taken away from them, and the fact that you only use a pronoun to talk about someone behind their back, do we really want this on our name tag? Right. I'm not going to call you, she or her to your face right. or he or him or anything else, right? Yeah. You're only going to use those pronouns if the person is not present. So think about it. Pronouns are gossip. Wow. This is, the, I mean, that's revolutionary, I have to say, Susan. I mean, I've been talking a lot about identity politics and just the divisiveness of, of the what I believe is an agenda around um, the way that it's being, you know, utilized to divide us. But that is, that's revolutionary, thinking of it that way. That's absolutely, I mean, that just rung my bell. Right. <laughs> Let's be together face to face, right? Yeah. <laughs> Who would you like to be today? I'm all for it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, so. <laughs> my, my granddaughter plays an avatar game where she can be anything she wants to be as an avatar, right? Yeah. She can change her height, her skin color, her eyes, how many limbs she has. She can... mm. So cool. How wonderful that she has access to that, you know? Yeah. I think about how, you know, I grew up in this very narrow kind of view. I never even heard the word lesbian until I went to college. Right, right. Right? Right. So, and uh, here she is at 13, and she sees the panoply of different things that you can be. Wow. Yeah. It's, yeah, very exciting. It is yeah. exciting, because ultimately, I mean, in the, the most exalted form, it's, it's a way that all, all is included. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. that, you know, and that's that's why I'm so in favor of genetic modification. Hmm. 
Because we're all one, aren't we? What is DNA made of? Four proteins. You can't say that there's tomato DNA or fish DNA because there isn't. There's just DNA. It doesn't belong to any one of us. I met the woman who did this in New Zealand. She told me that she was very concerned with climate change mm -hmm. and that people who had dependably been able to grow tomatoes in frosty areas were getting frosts. And if you've ever grown a tomato and had a frost, you know what happens. The tomato plant is killed. It's not like it's just injured a little and it springs back. We're not talking about a citrus tree here. We're talking about a tomato plant. And even one night of frost will completely destroy all of your plants. So she was concerned about small farmers. And she thought, you know, there are many plants that don't freeze. Maybe there's something in the plants that don't freeze that I could find and put in the tomato. And then the tomato wouldn't freeze and I could protect these farmers. And she told me that she spent 10 years trying to find that. Wow. And that it was like doing plumbing on your back, blindfolded with your non-dominant hand in a glove. <laughs> So after 10 years, she decided to take a break. And that's why I met her in New Zealand. Because somebody said, why don't you go to New Zealand? Because down there in Antarctica are fish that swim in water that's below freezing. Hmm. So she was down there to look at these fish. And she had just come back from her trip. And she said, these fish have a gene that prevents them from freezing that they got from a pine tree millions of years ago. So nature gave the not freeze gene from a plant to the fish to keep it alive. Right. And because it was only millions of years ago, it was in a place where she could get to it really easily and transfer it to the tomato. Is this some diabolical plot? No, this is a woman who's concerned for other people. Right. 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 There's a woman who's concerned that a quarter of a million children go blind every year from lack of vitamin A. Lack of any green, red, or yellow vegetables in their diet causes a quarter of a million children in the more impoverished nations to go blind. Within 12 months, half of them will be dead as a consequence of their blindness. So she took the orange from a carrot and put it into rice and developed golden rice. And the test pot was burned down hmm. by activists. Hmm who I guess prefer blind children. It's so complex. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm just, um, this, is so, <laughs> this is so good for people to hear because. Yeah, I, I this is really important. It's yeah. so important yeah. because. It's so important. I was, a, I was a polio pioneer when I was a child. They came to my school and they said, who would like to help us develop a vaccine against polio? And I had seen friends crippled from polio. So I raised my hand and over the course of a year, I had, live vaccine and dead vaccine and shots and oral and, and you know i pioneered the whole thing so that we have virtually wiped polio off of this planet the only right. places right. where it still exists are a few places in africa where they are pretty much convinced that any inoculation from white people is going to give them aids yeah yeah and it's a difficult one to unconvince them from so what we've done is we've um genetically modified a goat to express polio vaccine in its milk <laughs> and we now have that goat's milk in these places and within a year or two where there will be no more polio on this planet except preserved in laboratories mind-blowing so i mean since we're on I, these are, right these, these are not things done to control people or to hurt people yeah. they're people that i know that are doing this are compassionate they are they are bodhisattvas hmm. And, and what, I mean, while we're here, so is this your opinion on this current vaccine? Talk to me about this. Absolutely. Yes. You know, up until this vaccine, we were still basically doing it the old way, which is scratch somebody and put some pus in the wound. Right. Right. That was how we started. All right. He saw that milkmaids generally didn't get smallpox. And he said, how's that? And they said, oh, we get cowpox. And he said, really? And he started scratching people and putting smallpox in the wound. And sure enough, they didn't get smallpox. And wow, we got the idea that we could do inoculations and vaccinations. And we're more sophisticated at it now. Right. But that is basically still what we're doing. 
We're still putting the organism, whether it's alive or dead, whether it's oral or a shot, into the person's body. So the person's body recognizes it. I was talking to you about viruses once. And I said, you know, your body has, takes a certain amount of time to recognize and be able to get rid of the virus. And the, uh, the student said, well, how long does that take? And I said, oh, I don't know. But because the goddess is so graceful, there was a virologist in class. And she said, it usually takes a few weeks longer than you live. Right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's, that's, that's nature, right. I'm that's reading, nature I'm for reading, you. <laughs> I'm reading to my granddaughter the um, a, a autobiography of Hannah Brees, a woman in the 1900s who went to Alaska to teach on her own. And she arrives at this village where she's supposed to teach, but there's no one left in the village because they all died of smallpox. Wow. And she goes on to the next village and there are no children in that village because they all died of whooping cough. Hmm. And my granddaughter is looking at me. She's never heard of these things happening. Right. 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 Because vaccinations and inoculations suffer from their own success. Hmm. What, we think we don't we think we don't need them because they're so successful that we don't remember what life was like without them. Susan, this is like I'm like so excited that this perspective you're bringing this perspective because it, I I really think we have to look at things from all sorts of perspectives. Else, we get all caught sorts up. of perspectives. I'm not telling anybody what they should or shouldn't do. Yes, but I will tell you that the evidence for sonograms changing brains and producing autistic children is a lot more solid than any connection between vaccines. Hmm. And and what do you? And think yet, women are going for sonogram after sonogram after sonogram. Right. Right, right. Those are sound waves. They are jiggling that baby's brain yep. at a very delicate time. Yep, yep. What do you so, think about this nanotech, you know, just all Yay, that, that... nanotech. As I said, it's a whole new thing, right? Yeah, yeah. We're, you know, we're not giving you the coronavirus. Yeah. What we've done is we've sequenced the protein that protects that coronavirus, and that's what's being given in the vaccination. So the body then recognizes that unique protein which is unique to the coronavirus and attacks that. So there's very little way for it to go muck hmm. because it's so specific. And this will absolutely change how we do vaccinations because now we can be that specific. And it's like going from finger painting to having a sable brush. Wow. Wow. And do you recommend any kind of herbal uh, formulae around vaccinations for the people who are feeling really nervous about it or just you anybody? Know, you know, um, before the show, um, I had a wonderful uh, time with your helper. And she said, well, you have a few minutes. Why don't you go and drink some water? Um, and then she walked away. And I would have said to her, I don't drink water. <laughs> water water can, never can hydrate you. Yeah. And so I suggest that people stop drinking water. I've heard this. And most, pe most people look at me and go, uh, 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 but everybody's selling us to drink water. I said, well, think about it. Your cells are protected by a lipid layer. Lipids are fats. Yeah. What makes your cells, cells in your body is it's surrounded by fat. And fat and water don't mix. So drinking water can't ever hydrate you. What I drink are nourishing herbal infusions. And what what I have seen from my students and apprentices is when you get in the infusion habit and that's what you drink, things change. Yeah. The first thing that happens is what you want to eat changes because the nourishing herbal infusions are nourishing your ability to smell and taste. Right, and this can happen in as short as five days. So cool. We do, right, we do a Green Goddess Apprentice Week here every day, every year, and the Green Goddesses are not allowed to drink anything but nourishing herbal infusion. We supply lots of it, and they're here starting from Monday. Some of them come the weekend before, and by Saturday night, then, we do our goddess pageant, and I bring out the cookies and the chocolate. And I pass them around, have this, have that, you know, and I pass it around a second time and I pass it around a third time. And then Sunday morning, I bring it out and say, look at how little we ate. Hmm. And they say, yeah, it tasted good, but I didn't need much of it. Right. 
All I needed was a taste. Yep. So it's not like suddenly you become, you know, the high guru of clean food and you will never eat sugar. Again. <laughs> right. We love sugar. We right. love sugar. We love sugar. What do we call the people we really love? We call them sugar, yeah. honey, <laughs> sweetie. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> You're always going to want them. That mother's milk is very, very sweet. It's yeah. the taste of love for yeah. sure. Yeah. Right. So, so you're going to want that. If you're not mineralized enough, you're going to go for more and more and more. And if you're mineralized, then wow, just a little bit is so satisfying. And people say, wow, you know, uh, all of these years trying to take, you know, these um, these drugs to improve my mood. All I had to do was drink nourishing herbal infusions. And now I'm so happy to be alive. Right. Well, I was able to get off my blood pressure medicine. Oh, my gosh, my diabetes is gone. And literally from doing nothing other than ditching the water and drinking nourishing herbal infusions. So whether you're going to get vaccinated or not going to get vaccinated, start drinking nourishing herbal infusions. It's probably one of the best ideas I've ever had. <laughs> I 2020 was the year of the miracle for me. Mm. Right? They wheeled me into surgery mid-May. 17 hours later, they placed the last stick. And they put me in a coma for 13 hours. I was not allowed to sit up for three months. They turned me loose from the hospital weighing 119 pounds. I rebuilt myself with nourishing herbal infusions. That happened this I year? Did. This year? That happened. That's right. In 2020. Wow. Right. And I'm 74 years old. Right. I told them the four surgical teams beforehand. I said, you're not operating on a Ford. You're operating on a Mercedes. Treat it like a Mercedes. <laughs> Good last words mm -hmm. before you go in. <laughs> right. The, the lead surgeon came to me in, in the hospital where I was, you know, being restored. And he said, you know, you said that, that you weren't a Ford, you were a Mercedes. He said, that's not quite true. He said, you're a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> Nourishing herbal infusions. Wow. Yeah. Right. It works for everybody. You don't have to worry about whether you're Pitta or Kappa or anything like that. You don't have to worry about whether you're young or old. It works for premature babies. It works for, for the grannies at 120. Everybody of every age, every inclination, and every pronouning benefits from drinking nourishing herbal infusions. My best story is a woman who wrote to me and she said, I went to my doctor. And my doctor said, you have severe osteoporosis and we're putting you on, you on drugs. And she said, bad word, bad word, you are not. And the doctor said, well, then you'll take a calcium supplement. And she said, I will absolutely not take a calcium supplement, which is very wise mm -hmm. because women who take calcium supplements are twice as likely to break a bone. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, then you'll exercise. She said, I will not exercise. Wrong answer. Right? <laughs> At any rate, that was her answer. She says to me in the letter, so she went home. And over the next couple of years, she lost about three inches in height, which is problematic. Yeah. And she said she didn't mind. She just hemmed up her pants and her skirts. But what she minded was getting so tired, and she was really tired. And she asked her daughter, who had graduated from a correspondence course with me, what she could use to have more energy. And her daughter said, stinging nettle infusion. You weigh it one ounce of stinging nettle, put it in a jar, a quart jar, fill the jar to the top with boiling water, stir it, put some more water if you have to, put a tight lid on it, let it steep overnight, strain it the next morning, put it in the fridge, drink it through the day. So she tried it and she said, wow. She said, oh my gosh, you know, I've done this twice now and I feel like a teenager again. She was in her mid 60s. She says, does that weed woman have any other nourishing herbal infusions? <laughs> and, and, and she said, yeah, you know, there's, there's oat straw. We know about people who are feeling their oats. And, oh, oh, right? and there's red clover with roots that go around the, the world. Oh, red clover gets into all the nooks and crannies. Linden, about a hundred times better as an anti-inflammatory than turmeric mm. and much tastier as well. Let's face it. Most Americans don't want to eat turmeric in all of their food. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. true. I like a little turmeric here and there, bit. but I don't want all my food to taste the turmeric. But Linden is wonderful and a fabulous anti-inflammatory in comfrey, which is why my tissues are Ferrari and not Ford. All right, comfrey makes you strong and flexible. So we rotate through these five nourishing herbal infusions. They are a large amount of herb, one ounce of dried herb in a small amount of water, a quart of boiling water, which allows us to maximally get the 
proteins, the vitamins, the the phytopharmaceuticals, as they're being called, right? Mm -hmm. The anthocyanins, the polyphenols, right? All of those good things. But most especially and most important, the thing that really will have a difficult time getting from your food, and that's minerals. Right. The nourishing herbal infusions mineralize, and they mineralize you fast, and they require no digestive capacity at all. You drink them, they go into your bloodstream. You don't have to digest them. By drying the herb and brewing it for four or more hours, you make it instantly available to your body. Wow. Wow. I, I even, because I wanted to be a good student, I brought my nourishing herbal. Yay. Herbal. <laughs> Is that red clover or nettle? Um, it has some red clover. It's a, it's, it's, it's a fertility one. It's a fertility one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> So what's really important to me is intimacy with the herbs. Uh, as I say to people, how many people do you like to get in bed with at night? To get in bed with five people? Most of us don't, correct? Right. Most of us like to get in bed with, with <laughs> some one of us person. Do, but <laughs> I, some of us do, but most of the, but if you do that, usually they're small beings that you're in bed with, right? <laughs> so, um, there are herbs that's not safe to drink at infusion strength. And any herb that we're drinking, if we mix it with another herb, we brought another person to bed with us. So our body can't tell us what's really going on. What I prefer that people do, if they want to drink a variety of herbs safe for fertility, is to have red clover on one day, and then what are some other herbs in your plant? Um, you know what? I don't, I actually, someone mixed it for me and I don't know everything. I know there's nettle and I know there's, okay. there's red uh, clover, but I don't uh -huh. know what else. But you don't know what else. So we don't even really know whether it's safe for you to drink that. Right. Look, if I keel over during this interview, Susan, it's been yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> no, it, it's not that kind of, it's not that you're going to keel over. Herbs that have aromas, like the mints. Mm. Those aromas are volatile oils. And when you brew this for a long time, when you make an infusion, which is brewed for a long time, those volatile oils concentrate. And they're very harsh on the kidney and the liver. Mm. So it's, you're not going to keel over, but your liver function will go down and your kidney function will go down. Everybody's had the experience, if you mess around with herbs, of making a pot of chamomile tea, not drinking it all. And then the next morning saying, I'll finish this off. It's like, ah! Right, and you can't drink it. It's really bitter. And if you look in the teapot, there's like an oily scum on the top. That's what happens when you brew aromatic herbs for a long time. And that's not safe for a woman who wants to get pregnant. Mm. And again, this is the, one of the reasons that I say, don't combine your herbs. Do them one at a time. I love, I love a mono thing. I'm into the yeah. mono, mono diet. Mono, mono thing, right. Yeah. So red clover, absolutely. Yeah, red clover is um, renowned for aiding and abetting fertility, especially for women over 40 mm -hmm. who might also want to use some Vitex, which is best used as a tincture, not as an infusion. Right. Right. Because Vitex can kind of reset your fertility clock. I like that. And you think the, the, the tincture more than um, uh, kind of a gel oh, yeah. cap or whatever. Yeah. Oh, never, never, never take herbs in capsules. Yeah. Herbs in capsules are the most expensive, least effective, and most dangerous way to take herbs. Tell us more. Why? Why would you want to take an herb in a capsule? What's the point of taking an herb in a capsule? It makes it look like a pill? Well, it's not a pill. It's an herb. Drugs have a direction of action. I give you a drug to reduce your blood pressure. That's what it's going to do. It's going to reduce your blood pressure. Well, unfortunately, it will have some side effects as well, probably leach potassium out of your body or, you know, have some, some difficult things. But an herb has a sphere of action. So if I suggest that you take Hawthorne because your blood pressure is high, Hawthorne will also increase the resilience of your blood vessels will increase the pumping capacity of your heart and will increase the strength of your capillaries. So it's not just a pointing finger. 
it's a whole sphere of activity mm. that the plant brings to us that allows us to work with it in the same way that we can make friendships and have a particular workflow with that friendship like Astrid and I, right? Right. Right. Right, which would be not as easy if it was a whole, if it was a group book, right? Right, right. I mean, it's hard enough already to get two people to agree. It really is. It's <laughs> right. <laughs> That's why people say to me, conspiracy, I'm like, I got to tell you, the world that I live in, I have yet to see a group of people who can <laughs> a, agree on something, yes. all of them, and then keep it secret. <laughs> I've just never seen it happen. I mean, you know, hey, believe it if you want. But... Yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be so? I'd love to be part of one of that groups that would, would agree on something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with groups of women, you have to get to the point of agreeing that we might be able to agree sometimes. <laughs> no, with groups of women, it's a, it's a, this is a whole beast. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we want to hear each other. I think that's what's really important to us as women. Yeah. Is that we don't want that shyest voice to be overpowered. Yeah. We want to take the time to really hear because I know that I've often found that that shyest voice, that smallest voice is the one that really is telling me what I need to know. Yeah. And that if I can get her to, to share with us, to share with me, um, that I will gain a lot. It's true that the tend and befriend is, um, you know, it is, is really the, the kind of primordial way that women want to be with yeah. each other, you know? Right. Um, what, like, what's your favorite over all of these years? I, I, I find that it's, you know, I always go back to basics. There's always like several things that really kind of do it. Um, and, uh, what, what, what are those things for you? Like, what are your go-tos around just your kind of your own immune system and your, you know, just your kind of, um, uh, well, you know, I was in the hospital in COVID days Yeah, and that meant I was alone. Yeah. Not that nurses didn't come in, but human contact was very slight because I was in Manhattan right? and May, whew, a lot of COVID going on in Manhattan yeah. in May. So yeah. it's a very, and I had brought, you know, jars, quart jars with an ounce of herb weighed out in them. I had suitcases full of jars ready to make infusion for, for myself, but I couldn't even get up out of bed. I couldn't even ask for my suitcase to be opened. And so I realized that I was either going to be able to heal myself or advocate for myself, but not both. So I just said, I am going to let them do whatever they want to do. And they gave me bad drugs. Right. Very bad drugs. And I went with that because I literally was incapable of using the remedies I had with me. When they discharged me from the hospital, the pharmacist called me, COVID days, and said, you have a prescription for this bad opioid drug, and you have a prescription for this bad opioid drug. She didn't say bad, I'd say bad. Yeah. Uh, she said, and you have to take these drugs. You cannot stop taking them or terrible things will happen to you. She said, and you cannot take any herbs of any kind. And I said, I've been an herbalist longer than you've been alive. Right. Do you know who I am? <laughs> I said, you're not going to tell me what herbs I can and can't take. I said, are you suggesting I shouldn't eat garlic or parsley or uh, dill or have pizza with oregano? And she said, well, you know what I mean, herbs and capsules. I said, oh, is that what you mean? Because <laughs> that's not what you said. What you said was no herbs. And of course, right, I mean, hey, even romaine lettuce will used to be considered an herb. Right? It's pretty potent stuff. Right? Yeah. So um, I came home and my daughter and I read the package inserts on all the drugs. And we, um, it turns out, did a bad thing. We threw them in the trash. Apparently, we weren't supposed to throw them in the trash. We were supposed to take them to a poison control center. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I just stopped on the dime taking that stuff because it's bad news. Yeah. And cannabis 
it was really been there for me. And I really harangued the doctors at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I said, why are you not prescribing cannabis? What is wrong with you that you're prescribing opiate drugs to people? Right? At least give them a try in cannabis. And they, you know, they gave me a, a, a lot of excuses hmm. for it. But um, this year I hear from, from people that I'm helping who are in the system uh, that they're at least talking. They're at least suggesting it to people. They say, they we can't prescribe it for you, but. We suggest that you try cannabis things before you try the opioids. Hmm. It's like, yes, yes, that's all we're asking. He said, people, get a chance to see because it's a non-addictive pain control system in your body. Right. Not everybody's going to respond to it. But most people, what I find is if you're in pain and you take cannabis, you're not getting high. I don't care how much THC is in there your body is going to sop it up to deal with the pain. Right, right. Right. It's not like, oh, I, I can't drive a car. It's like, you know, for most people, it's like, oh, now I can because I have my wits about me and I'm not in excruciating pain. Right. And that brings us back to why is it for the childbearing year continued because there is a growing epidemic of opioid drugs being prescribed to pregnant women. How can we do this? Really? Yes. For what? Not, not less, but more and more and more. For pain. Wow. For pain. And antipsychotic drugs prescribed for pregnant women. These are not appropriate for pregnant women. I would actually much rather see you, you know, drink strong chamomile here, strong fennel you know, infusion, which is not good for you, than to take opioid drugs. And people say, oh, well, cannabis is not good for pregnant women. I say, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are not good for pregnant women either. Right, right. Right. You know, the baby is not going to get addicted to cannabis. It's a non-addictive plant. There is no addictive pathway in the human body for cannabis. Hmm. Right. Hey, I live in Woodstock, one of the cannabis capitals of the world. You want to yeah. see what cannabis withdrawal looks like? Yeah. That's about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> I've seen people. I've seen people go through coffee withdrawal here, where they're like, "I can't drink water. Can I drink coffee?" <laughs> you're at home. You want to drink coffee? That's fine. I'm, there's nothing wrong with coffee. It's a plant too. But you're here as a green goddess. No, you're not drinking coffee. You're drinking nourishing herbal infusion. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but wait, at home, hey, you want some coffee? That's fine. But what I suggest that people do is they drink their infusion first thing in the morning. Yeah. Because it really starts your day off and you get so much energy without the hype from your nourishing herbal infusion that then if you decide you want that coffee later on during the day, you get more medicinal benefit from the coffee. Hmm. Great. And Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and, and I guess in that cannabinoid family, all the CBDs and, and the different cannabinoids, you know, exist, like in terms of their healing properties. I mean, I think we're fine. You know, so many people are talking about this. Oh, yes, exactly. Well, we could roughly break it down into CBD and THC, but yes, there's many cannabinoids. But what really is doing most of the heavy lifting are the terpenes. And those are those volatile oils that I was talking about before. Mm. Things like humulene and melissine and right, all different kinds of things that, you know, I use the image of the key. So you have a key and if you look at it from sideways, it's like cut, right? It's like different level so it, then it fits into the lock and it turns the tumblers and if you put the key that has the wrong cuts in it it's not going to do it even though it's a key so the terpenes are like the cuts in the key and in states that allow you to use named varieties you can find the key that exactly fits your pain relief system and it's not a matter of does it have cbd or does it have thc it's a matter of what are those terpenes and how do they affect you? And so you need to be able to try different things. What I've also found is that most people who use cannabis and wine in the hospital have eaten it. Right. 
And it's one of the herbs that I find is absolutely best smoked. And one of the reasons is that you can very finely dose it when it's smoked. Right? If someone inhales some and they say, oh, that's enough. Well, that's enough. Right. And you know immediately and there's no more given. When people are eating it, they don't know what the effect is. They don't wait long enough and they say nothing is happening and they eat more. Yeah. And the next thing you know, they have heart palpitations and they're not breathing and they're dizzy and they're falling down. And that's what they used to do in the Arab souks. They would just, you know, put cannabis in people's food and they would pass out and then they would rob them and put them in the gutter. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I've had that happen. Don't eat it. <laughs> Don't eat it. That's it. You want to be robbed and put in the gutter. Come on. You know? <laughs> Smoking is good for your lungs. Herbalists all over the world encourage people to smoke for the good of their lungs. Right? We're not talking about chain smoking cigarettes. As one of my college professors did. Right? He literally would have two or three going at any one time. <laughs> all right. Not good for him. But he was in World War II, and he had a lot of post-traumatic stress that he was dealing with with all that tobacco, and it really worked for him. It's a shamanic herb. Right? But a small amount of smoke in the lungs, right, especially in a ritual way, opens up the lungs. It does not, as a matter of fact, you know, they really wanted to pin lung cancer on cannabis smokers, but and what did they find? They find that cannabis smokers are far less likely to get any kind of cancer, including lung cancer. Hmm. I hadn't heard that. Yeah. Interesting. And, yes. and, and what other herbs do you think are best smoked? Mullen is a wonderful herb to smoke. The native people of North America had about 100 different herbs that they smoked. Each person had a mix, which was their own specific shamanic mix. And, and from culture to culture, who was allowed to smoke varied. In many cultures, only postmenopausal women and shamans are allowed to smoke because it's such a um, spiritual act that you have to have some life experience and some understanding before you can engage mm -hmm. in it. Um, in other cultures, anyone is allowed to smoke so long as they have the training of how you do this. And the, 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 um, the idea here is that this is deep medicine. Deep medicine would include surgery. You don't go for surgery with a dull knife and someone who doesn't know what they're doing. You get a surgeon, you go in a sterile environment, you take care. So using cannabis, using tobacco, these are deep medicines. You want to take the same care because there we do know that these are power plants. And if you don't bring your power to the table, well, the power plant will be happy to take you over. Well, you bring your power to the table, then you have a relationship hmm. there and you can use your power together. And this is what we want. And this is why there are certain rituals and ways of doing this. Um, Fascinating. Sumac, sumac berries were one of the favorite of the native people to smoke. And in fact, sumac berries went to Europe before tobacco. Not a lot of tobacco was smoked. Many native cultures believed that the power of the tobacco was so strong that if you looked at it while it was growing, that you would be in its power. And they would uh, walk backwards to the tobacco plot, or they would um, have like a little maze entrance and put on a blindfold. So they didn't actually look at the tobacco while they were cultivating it or watering it. Power plants. These are plants that have actual power yeah. in them. Yeah. And so the Europeans weren't introduced to tobacco at first because not a lot of it was used. They were introduced to sumac because a lot of it was used. And sumac went to Europe and people loved smoking sumac. It's a wonderful, wonderful smoke. But then when tobacco did eventually go to Europe, it won because it's addictive. Right. <laughs> Right, and sumac isn't, and mullein uh, isn't, and huh. corn silk isn't, and mint isn't, and kinikinik, uva ursi isn't, right? And willow bark isn't, and all of the other 99 herbs that were used for smoking aren't addictive. Mm -hmm. And so now people associate smoking only with tobacco and have kind of lost the idea that, oh, right, 
the closest that many people come to it is a smudge. Right, right. Right, we're using a smoking herb and you're not literally bringing it to your mouth and inhaling it, but there's enough to smoke there that you are inhaling it. You're getting a contact. Um, you are definitely taking it into your lungs. And the Australian women made like um, a small fire and let it burn down to coals and then put green eucalyptus leaves all over it and threw a little water on it. And boy, did that, I mean, that cloud of eucalyptus mm, smoke. Mm. And we had to walk through, right? You didn't have to like leap over the fire, but you had to like be totally immersed mm. in this entire cloud of eucalyptus smoke before you could take part in the ceremony. So good. That sounds amazing. Yeah. So that's smoking too, isn't it? Like yeah. my whole body was smoked in yeah. a way. Yeah. 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 What, what it, what's... In, in the same way, we almost lost using animal fats in our ointments. Mm -hmm. I, I came once again late to class and uh, the uh, Australian women were passing around a eucalyptus ointment. And the woman who passed it to me said, they squeezed all the eucalyptus oil out of the leaves by hand. I said, no, they didn't. She said, yes, they did. I said, this is eucalyptus leaves and olive oil. And then I just you know, shut up because I'm late. And I'm in the back and I don't want to like, yeah. make news. <laughs> and and the, so then you know, after the class was done, we were allowed to ask questions. I said, tell us how you made the eucalyptus oil. And she said, well, we took the eucalyptus leaves and we put it in olive oil. We let it master for six hours and we straightened it out. And then we think it was beeswax. I'm like, yeah, right. Like everybody else does. Right. I said, I said, but olives don't grow in Australia. What did you used to do? And they said, what do you mean used to do? I said, before the white people came, mm -hmm. what did you used to do? How did you used to make this? You didn't have olive oil or beeswax. She said, oh, we used kangaroo fat. Right. She said, we put the eucalyptus leaves and the kangaroo fat. And the kangaroo fat carries the action of the herb into the bone marrow where it changes your DNA. Oh, okay. And she said, and then we couldn't hunt any kangaroos anymore. Right. Right. I said, well, what'd you do then? She said, then we used emu oil. She said, we'll carry it to the bone. It can't carry it inside the bone, but it will carry it to the bone. And it will carry it deep inside the bone. Now, anybody can get hold of emu oil. Yeah, yeah. And and, and as I uh, I believe that no emus are hurt in the processing. No. There. <laughs> No, so <laughs> you can rest easily with your emu oil. But think about it, you know, each organ in a mammal's body is surrounded by fat. There's yeah. cardiac fat, there's kidney fat, and each each of those organs with the fat around it, that fat is the repository of the communicators in the body, which are hormones, which are specialized kinds of fat. So the fat around the kidneys has cortisone in it, doesn't it? Yeah. Because your body's making cortisol and keeping it there. Yeah. And I realized this when I was reading Hildegard of Bingen, and she suggested for a woman who had a lump in her breast, an ointment made from an herb. And we have no idea which herbs she used because she had her own names for them, and they don't relate to anything that we have. Right. So it's right. very difficult to know what herb, particular herb, but... To me, what was important was that the herb was to be done in the belly fat of a young male goat. And I went, testosterone. Right. She wants an ointment with testosterone to counter estrogen. She's not thinking cancer. This is 1,100 years ago. Yeah. She's not thinking estrogen, testosterone. As a matter of fact, it was Hildegard who stood up and said, women have a role in reproduction. Because for 3,000 years before that, women had no role in reproduction. The woman was a blank slate, a barren field and the man sowed his seed into that field and it was totally his child right and hildegard said are you kidding <laughs> <laughs> take a look around you <laughs> get a grip <laughs> really <laughs> So I said, oh, my gosh, right? Where, where, where has this been all of my life? And I'd always wondered, why do people say you have to heat the olive oil? Well, obviously, you don't have to heat the olive oil. You do a cold maceration. Mm -hmm. It works just fine. Why would they say that? Because if you're using animal fat, it does have to be kept warm. Right. To keep it liquid. Right. And so the, the instruction to keep it warm stayed, even as the fat that was being used got changed. Changed.
All right. So in a kind of in the, in the in-betweens, there are the emu oil, which we talked about, um, coconut oil, and jojoba oil. Those are almost as good as animal fats, but how wonderful that we now have access to good quality animal fats. I was sitting one day and talking to Sally Fallon, and we were having one of those, oh, things are so bad moments. Yeah. And the thing that we were upset that was so bad was that family farms were disappearing. And at that point, the statistic was that a family farm was going out of business every five minutes in the United States. Wow. And we're like, what can two women do to stop this? And we thought about, we talked about what makes a family farm. And it's the integration of animals and plants. Mm. Mm. You grow the plants for the animals, and then the animals give you things that fertilize the soil that allow you to grow the plants. Right? So the whole web of life is intact in the family farm. It's not just a farm growing wheat right. or just a farm keeping cows. It's a whole thing going on, and that's why we're in, in favor of it. And we thought, well, what's going wrong here? is that there's not enough people eating meat. Mm -hmm. Because the meat is where the family farm is going to make their money. And the people eating that meat will actually have an influence on that animal's life. Or as I say to vegans, right? If I were to say to you, I love you so much that you're not allowed to come in my house and I want nothing further to do with you, how much love would you feel? <laughs> right. <laughs> Right? Telling something that we love it, but we're not going to consume it is not love. I'm a woman. When I love something, I want it in my body. Yep. <laughs> right? yep. I, yep. Let me surround you. Let me take you <laughs> in. Let me make you me. Yeah. And then make something yeah. new from that having made you me. So Sally Fallon and I went out and started saying, eat meat. Eat, yeah. eat me. Are you crazy? I'm like, no, no, get out there and eat me so that now you can go out. In my local supermarket, I choose regular chicken, organic chicken, hormone-free chicken, antibiotic. Chicken. I have all, yeah. Right. grass yeah. I mean, I yeah. have all of these choices in an ordinary supermarket yeah. because people of good heart started eating meat again and were able, family farms are now thriving. Well, you know, they, they, they do, uh, that there's a whole conspiracy theory on um, this uh, impossible uh, companies owned by, you know, the Bezos and the Zuckerbergs and the, um, <laughs> but I mean, that's the truth. And that there's some, you know, an agenda, kind of a transhumanist agenda to get people to stop eating real food. Right. Well, we know what happens when people stop eating real food. Yeah. <laughs> Their health suffers. Yeah. Yeah. What do you? Yeah, what, and, and and we've known for a very long time. It, and as a matter of fact, ever since Weston Price, yeah. right, wrote his book, yeah, right, Nutrition and Human Degeneration. What a title! It's a brilliant. I mean, I, I'm not saying everybody should go out. You know, his his stuff is 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 thick it's and kind of dense. It, it's <laughs> dense, but I mean, the 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 photography of what happens, the degeneration is of the you know jaw and the bones and the facial structure. I mean, that is profound. And we're not talking over generations here either. We're talking about from one child to the next when the, what is he called, the, the over-processed products of the food industry are yeah. introduced into the diet. Yeah. Yeah. So within one pregnancy, you see those bone changes and health, health destruction. Yeah. 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 And again, nourishing herbal infusions, wow, suddenly you just can't eat that stuff anymore. It's not willpower. It's not, oh, I think I shouldn't. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, but bleh, <laughs> my it body will. Yeah. It totally changes how you, how you relate to it. And you want the, that food to be more real. Hmm. And, and mm. what's, But not raw. Right, right. Not raw. You know, humans, Homo made a, a stab at raw. And those who did had a jaw two to four times bigger than our jaw. And a brow ridge, right, this bone here, hmm. stuck out by more than an inch so that huge muscles could fasten from that to the jaw to chew all of that raw food. We have not found any bones from any of these homos 
that were lived in for more than 30 years. Hmm. As soon as we find bones from homos who cooked their food, we start finding bones 40, 50, 60 years old. As far as we can tell, cooking food doubled the human lifespan. Wow. I mean, I'm there is no and there is no enzyme in any food that's used in your body. With very few exceptions, and those exceptions are the enzymes in raw meat, raw milk, raw eggs, raw fish, and raw insects. Well, the- but an enzyme is a protein in your stomach is designed to destroy all enzymes because you are a bag of enzymes. Everything that happens in your body is enzyme mediated. And if any enzymes from outside got in, you would come to a crashing halt. Yeah, the, that's a whole, I mean, that narrative is you just, you just in, uh, in 20 words, Susan, we just totally destroyed <laughs> raw foodism. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you'd like an you hour of it, go, if you'd like an hour of it, go to YouTube and find the raw versus cooked debate where I debate Brigitte Mars Ooh. about raw and cooked food. Ooh. Yeah. And what's really scary is that not long after we made that video, she wound up in the hospital. Wow. Wow. And they said to her that basically the reason she was alive is that I had made her promise me to eat a cup of yogurt every day. Wow. Fascinating. Oh my God. That, yeah. I, I, I just love talking to you, Susan. You're just, you're, mm-hmm. wow. What a, what a, what, <laughs> I mean, you're just blowing my mind and I know. Everyone. I want women to be healthy and strong and vibrant and to, you know, show up yeah. and we got to, you know, we got to get ourselves nourished yeah. in order to do that. The, the scientific tradition measures and then it fixes. And unfortunately, fixity is not a definition of health. The heroic tradition says that we should be clean and we should be balanced. And those sound better. But I invite you all, everybody listening, to be balanced by inhaling. Well, no, there's a problem, isn't there? Because in order to be alive, what do you have to do? You have to breathe out. You have to exhale. <laughs> We're into, you that. Have to We're into exhale. that around here. <laughs> so, balance, balance is the opposite of life. In fact, so far as we know, it all started with a big bang kaboom. Yeah. It was some pretty good evidence that it really yeah. did indeed yeah. start with a big kaboom. And what did we have? Hydrogen, right? Hydrogen, hydrogen. All of space time was evenly covered in hydrogen. And we would still be there billions of years later with all of space-time evenly covered in hydrogen, except there was a perturbation. And that perturbation started a spiraling movement. And I think about the old, old woodcut image from India of the big egg and the snake and churning the sea of existence. Right? And so that perturbation started the churning of the sea of existence, sort of the spiral of life, which caused that hydrogen to come together, form into a sun, a star, to go into a nuclear state, which causes other elements to be made, and then to explode and to send all of those elements out into life, causing further dynamic disturbances, which cause other stars to be made, which have wound up with you sitting right there in your body today. If it was balanced, you'd be dead. Right. No balance. And clean, oh, that's the word that's not allowed to be used around me. <laughs> <laughs> clean basically means damage and destroy, right? Yeah. Because we live in a closed system. There's no toxins in a closed system. There's only food. Hmm. Right. As soon as we have a toxin, we have an excuse for war. And for peace, not for cleanliness. Not for making war on ourselves or anything that I perceive as bad. My first Zen teacher gave me my, my lifetime Cohen, which I don't know if, he, if no matter how long I live, if I will ever get to the center of, which is the difference between good and bad is the sickness of the human mind. Mm. <sighs> it's so difficult because we're so easily drawn into this is good and that is bad. Yeah. And to just... Right, really see, it is all one. We are all part of this. Not this part of me good, this part of me bad. But here we are, gathering ourselves together, gathering together, 
finding ways to um, I asked my friend Jennifer, who's here visiting, she said, it's such a, you know, a wonderful time. Things are changing. And I said, what's changing? She said, more and more people are aware that we are one. My daughter and I saw uh, Audubon magazine and they were talking about the uh, Corn Bill in, um, I don't remember where it was, but this particular culture, the ritual, all of the ritual things were made from the, the Horn Bill's horn, right? Mm. So their rattles were made and their, you mm -hmm. know, shaman's hats. And so they, they would just go out and kill hornbills to get the horns. Right. And truthfully, every native culture that I have been privileged to spend any time with acts exactly that way in the na natural world is go out and harvest it, go out and kill it. Mm -hmm. Right. What did the Maori do when they arrived in New Zealand? They burned down a thousand acres and planted a sweet potato. Mm -hmm. And then they hunted every bird that weighed more than a pound to extinction. So, Indigenous people honor the earth and may see the earth is very sacred, but it doesn't mean that they have what we would call an ecological consciousness right. about saving some of it. Right. So what has happened is that the white idea of capitalism and possession has come into this culture. And the head shaman said, good idea. And his tribe petitioned the court and they legally own their land so they can't cut down their forest and they can't make palm uh, oil plantations on their land right and now that they own that land they're no longer hunting the hornbill because they understand they could make it go away forever if they hunt too many right wow wow Wow, a group that has kept themselves isolated from human contact suddenly got contacted by whites and white ideas, which we would say bad, bad, bad. Right. And it gave them the idea that we had that you shouldn't use up all of what nature gives you. <laughs> Good and bad? <laughs> I mean, it's it's definitely against the, the, the narrative that's... that's um out there especially right now right yeah right yeah I, I i was told by a woman who felt that she had no culture and many americans feel that way yeah um and so she traveled to try to find culture and she wound up in a small village in nepal and she was really accepted and and taken care of there and she said i'm gonna live here and for many years she lived in that village and you know the things they did in that village that was how their grandmothers did it and their grandmothers, 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 grandmothers did it, right? They've been doing the same thing the same way for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And then something came to happen there that disrupted that pattern. Right. And those villagers were just going to lay down and die. Because that was all they had. But she was an American. And we have a plan B and a plan C and a plan yeah. D and a plan E yeah. and a plan F. And if plan A doesn't work, believe me, we got another plan. And she was able to avert this disaster by doing something differently. And she realized what she had. It wasn't that culture that had lasted for hundreds of years. It was something different, but it wasn't worth less. Right. Resilience. <laughs> well, I'm I'm definitely praying for the resilience of America right now. And yes, um, indeed, <laughs> uh, it's 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 in my prayers. And I, I mean, what a what an incredible transmission to just be with you for this time. And um, you know, I know that that you hear this all the time, but just uh, again to say to you that um, what you've done has has changed uh, history and um, what you continue to do. So thank you for everything that you are. You are so so welcome. Herbal medicine is people's medicine. It's the medicine of the people and by the people and for the people. It's the medicine that grows right outside your door. You don't need pills. You don't need formulas. Everybody recognizes dandelion. And dandelion is the most generous of all herbal medicines. Mm -hmm. Any part of dandelion picked any day of the year, prepared in any way, 
just good medicine. Wow. Thank you. And when does this new book come out? It's not out yet, right? Oh, it is. Yes. Oh, it is. Abundant, okay. Abundantly Well, Seven Medicines is out. No, but it's, this uh, new, um, the, the new child. Oh, the, oh, 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 we're just starting to, to work oh, on that. Just It'll be three years. We just literally just met last month. Okay. Okay. We agreed okay. on what we were going to do. And then, and then I just got a, a message from her and she said, you know, we have to meet every week and we're not going to do this. We're both too busy. And she, I said, yeah, that very wise. That's very wise. Astrid. we do. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. As one of my teachers said, you have to get up pretty early to get up before yourself, but it can be done. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's the truth. Um, but your newest book is Abundantly Well, Seven Medicines. Abundantly Well, okay. Seven Medicines, exactly. And I invite people to come over to wisewomanschool.com, and there they will find a free course on herbs that, that you can have on hand to help prevent COVID or to help get through it should you be diagnosed positive. Thank it's you. completely free. Enjoy yourself. Lots of other fun things there, but that's for all of us. We're all looking around and looking at how things need to change and how we need to change and what that's going to look like and what it's going to take. Ultimately, you have to make a, a narrative that makes sense to you, that gives you energy, and that allows you to navigate a more and more complex time on planet Earth. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Reality Riffing. These are conversations that I think are important with people who are doing great things in the world about subject matters that need to be discussed. If you enjoyed the content, the conversation, please feel free to share with your people, share with your friends and family, rate the podcast below, and also subscribe.